Continuing Education knows that at the end, students want to graduate, and we can help them do that because we take the time to really listen to their needs, and we understand all the different options that are available across the campus for them. We don't take a cookie cutter approach. We realize each student comes with their own story. So whether it's a part-time student looking to complete a degree program or someone just looking for online courses, we're there to connect them to the resources of the university. TV, print, yeah. radio. Yeah. No, no, we're actually. Uh, yeah. we're, uh, I was trying to say yes to everything. Yeah, because you can't afford to say. Yeah. I don't know if, if you felt this way too. I, I didn't feel like, okay, well, I don't I want, especially Florida, if there's uh, someone else out there. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. All, my, yeah. all my opportunities. And I, you know, if you say, were looking for a media mashup, you've come to the right place. My name is Ralph Gregory, and I am originally from the south side of Chicago, where politics is sport. <laughs> all politics, both parties. And that's all you need to know about me. <laughs> Today is Wednesday, April 10th, just in case you didn't know. It's 10.30 in the morning, and this is panel 17991, and its title is Fox versus CNN versus the people. So we're going to have some fun today. <laughs> but first, a word from our sponsor. The University of Colorado, Boulder, Colorado's flagship university, honors and recognizes the many contributions of indigenous peoples in our state. CU Boulder acknowledges that it is located on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and many other nation, Native American nations. Their forced removal from these territories has caused devastating and lasting impacts. While the University of Colorado Boulder can never undo or rectify the devastation wrought on indigenous peoples, we commit to improving and enhancing engagement with indigenous peoples on issues locally and globally. We will do this by recognizing and amplifying the voices of indigenous CU Boulder students, staff, faculty, and their work. By educating, conducting research, supporting student success, and integrating indigenous knowledge. By consulting, engaging, and working collaboratively with the tribal nations to enhance our ability to provide access and culturally sensitive support. By recruiting, retaining, and graduating Native American students in a climate that is inclusive and respectful. Thank you, Chancellor DiStefano. Okay, one other thing. We want you, the audience, to ask questions. Here's how. Just raise your hand and a producer will bring you a note card. There in the back, and they'll come up. And you can do this at any time during this conversation. And that's what we're having today, a round table, which is really a conversation among our panelists. Print your question, and that will be passed up to me. Please write legibly, briefly, and to the point. If you are a student, please write that word at the top. All righty, let's get to some media punditry. Starting at the far end of the table, Marcus Broccoli. And I'm going to take a drink here. You have a moment. <clears throat> if you read Marcus Broccoli's bio, you already know he's a local boy done good. But did you know that in 2008, he resigned his position as managing editor at the Wall Street Journal shortly before Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation announced a takeover of the journal's parent company? Just technically, um, after. <laughs> I'll bet he's got some stories. 
That's when he was hired as executive editor of the Washington Post. During his four-year tenure at the Post, they won seven Pulitzer Prizes, making it the second most visited American newspaper website behind that of the Wall Street Journal. Marcus stepped down as editor at the end of 2012 and took on a new role working with the Post's parent company just before the Post was sold to Jeff Bezos. <laughs> Since 2014, Market has been the co-founder of North Base Media, an investment firm focused on digital media opportunities in emerging markets, enabling media companies to engage audiences better. Murdoch and Bezos, I'll bet there's some stories there. <clears throat> also, next to Marcus, you'll see John Spencer. John is a combat veteran of both the uh, Afghan and Iraq wars, conflicts, and uh, he is also an author and one of the world's foremost experts in urban warfare. He is a military advisor to uh, generals and our uh, leading military folks. And last week, he debated someone by the name of Elon. <laughs> Sitting next to uh, John Spencer is Benjamin Teitelbaum. When Max graduated from Notre Dame in 2018, he and two others were just plain fed up with the partisanship so common in both TV and print media. So they said, our generation needs a new alternative. Let's build one. So they started Roca News. It's a down the middle outlet delivering fact centric stories to approximately 5 million followers across social media platforms that include Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. They also have a newsletter with more than 200,000 subscribers, and recently they launched an app that gamifies the news. That should be interesting, which is now approaching 40,000 monthly active users. More recently, Max and his two partners made the Forbes magazine list of 30 under 30 in media. Now, right there alone, you've got three serious professional news junkies. But we are not done yet. Max Toey, right, Max, right. Despite his youthful appearance, he has long been studying traditionalism in geopolitics, not just in the US, but in other small, small d, democratic countries, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, and Iceland. As you probably know, traditionalism is a philosophy that is associated with a restless subsection of the right. Professor Teitelbaum spent years infiltrating this strange group of self-styled thinkers, gurus, and philosophy, folks like Steve Bannon. Thus, his 2020 book about the rise of the populist right. I'd imagine he has some interesting things to say about modern media. Sitting, um, that was Max, so now I think we're up to Lisa. And uh, Lisa has been in a variety of capacities, including Deputy Assistant Attorney General and senior legislative strategist for the ACLU. Lisa has testified to congressional committees and authored articles such as The Billionaire Behind Efforts to Kill the U.S. Postal Service. Charles Koch. In 2020, Lisa was my guest on a Boulder TV talk show in which I introduced her as a Supreme Court junkie. <laughs> And she went on to regale viewers with tales of big money lobbying of certain justices. You know who and, they are. <laughs> and corruption in the federal court system. Lisa was well ahead of the curve four years ago, since it's only this year 
we are learning details of undue influence on the Supremes in Washington, and it's not a catchy tune. And at least I, I hope you brought some more dirt for us today. <laughs> so that's our light up to critique modern media. Marcus, let's start with you. I want to ask you a question about the big J, journalism, and objective analysis. Is the lack of economics in digital media still killing journalism, or is there a reemergence happening in some way? Well, I, I, I think journalism, journalism has come under a lot of economic pressure, as everyone here knows, in the last couple of decades. I don't think journalism per se is dead. I think if, if we ask people in this room, and not to offend anybody, but looking at the room, there's a lot of gray hair. I'm pretty sure everybody in this room knows where to go for information they trust and they rely on. Um, I don't think there's any shortage of good journalism on national, political, international, business, economic, entertainment topics. There's, there, if you know where to go for it, there's, there's a great deal of that information. The challenge in journalism, if I were to put my finger on the, the area that concerns me most, is local journalism, where the local media companies around this country have been unable to maintain their economics because audiences in, in communities have started to look to national news for their content. Tip O'Neill, the former Speaker of the House, used to say that all politics is local. And I think today, all journalism or all media consumption is national. People really read, read and watch a lot of national news. And to take this sort of back to the topic of, of this panel, people tend to gravitate towards news sources that reflect their point of view. There was a study that came out in December last year. Um, it was a, from a, a Yale and a Berkeley professor. And it was basically about um, whether people consuming aligned media aligned media, meaning media that aligns with their viewpoints, increases their polarization because it clearly increases their engagement. People who watch Fox or who watch MSNBC, which are sort of considered generally the two poles, not CNN as much, um, they tend to watch them with great engagement and they tend to, they tend to engage in what's called motivated reasoning, meaning that they, they look at the world through the framework outlined or created for them by Fox or MSNBC, and they look at events in that framework and they start to see the world in that way. So these two professors went out and decided to try and try an experiment. They took several hundred, in this case, Fox viewers, and they got them to watch CNN for a month to see if it would change the way they saw the world. And it was actually, you can imagine, a bit of a challenge. Some people didn't want to do it, but when they engaged and they watched CNN for a month, their viewpoints on a lot of issues changed, and their perception of the polarization in America moderated. And Are they both echo chambers? I, I would argue that uh, MSNBC and Fox are very much echo chambers. They are, they're, they're in that world of what's called aligned media, where people seek out a viewpoint that aligns with their own point of view. And I think it, it creates uh, polarization, and I think the challenge for our country right now in journalism is not that there isn't good information, it's that people aren't seeking out good journalism and good information. People are seeking out information that reaffirms or supports their point of view. And to take it back to your question, the reason I'm worried about local journalism is people spend more time watching Fox or MSNBC than they do reading community news and, and supporting their community news or local news. And so they're not well informed in their own communities, which is sort of the bedrock of our democracy. And, they're, and perhaps I, you could argue they're not well informed on national issues. Anyone have any comments for Marcus? I have thoughts. I appreciate that very much, Marcus. Um, and I also disagree. Uh, because I think polarization is being driven by a hard right movement in this country that's being fueled by a handful of billionaires to drive a very authoritarian regime. And I do think there is aligned media, but I don't think that they're equivalent. I don't think that the level of disinformation that we've seen documented on Fox is anywhere near uh, what someone might contend uh, about uh, the presentations on MSNBC throughout the day and in the evening. Um, and I think that, in my view, the polarization frame ignores you know, this 
uh, movement that really is pushing, pushing polarization through pushing a, a host of lies and uh, other disinformation. And I also think there's a, um, a substantial difference between an outlet that has um, tried to present fair, um, accurate information and one that has been subject to a 707, 787 million, nearly billion dollar settlement for its lies around the election, its uh, Fox's settlement with Dominion. So I just don't think they're the same, but I appreciate the point about local news, except that I would add from my, from my perspective that it's important to, to support local media like KGNU that's genuinely local. Local television stations are, in my view, commercial stations are paid to give you seven minutes of news, predominantly crime seven minutes of weather, predominantly from the National Weather Service, and seven minutes of sports, predominantly from corporate sports teams. That's not actually real news about what's happening in your community, and it rarely tells you what you can do before a law passes. It just tells you that a law just passed. I have a question for the panel. Is Randolph Hearst laughing from his grave with an I told you so? Yellow journalism? Maybe I'm making a reference that's uh, showing my demographic. <laughs> Yellow journalism Penny being, uh, and back at the turn of the century, he, uh, uh, Hearst made his fortune by producing what came to be known as yellow journalism, which was all this fluff and cultural media, lots of pictures, and it really didn't focus on the hard news of the day. It became more entertainment than news. So that's my question. Is that what's going on today? I mean, I, I, you have to acknowledge that all news is for profit. Mm -hmm. that, that's it. Whether you're Fox or any, somebody, even if you're a, a truth absol absolutionist, you still need resources. Follow be, the money. And there is no such thing as objective news. I, I holistically disagree with that. I've done 500 interviews in the last two and a half years to every news station there is. They want to know what I'm going to say before I say it. Do, do they edit what you're going to say? No, I mean, but they ask me questions, and sometimes if I answer those questions wrong, then you're not the guy we want to talk to. Mm -hmm. I went to doing 20 interviews a day about the Ukraine war because news for profit, believing in a cause, to my stance on Israel and Gaza, I do zero interviews a day. I... First of all, totally agree that there's no such thing as objective news. That's one reason why we call Roka News nonpartisan. And I think anytime you select a story, there's a level of bias. There's a value judgment. You say this is important, and you say it matters to our audience. And I also agree with John in that these companies, especially the ones in the name of the panel today, are for-profit enterprises. There's the 2020 Gallup poll, I believe that found that all those who consider MSNBC their main source of news, 95% are Democrats. For Fox News, 93%. CNN's a little more bipartisan, maybe because it's on dentist offices and airports, but <laughs> all, all of that's to say, these are unbelievably one-sided news orgs. So you bring up the Dominion defamation case. One of the texts that always jumped out that they disclosed in Discovery was from Tucker, who said, we're losing our base. They, he feared they were losing their base. It wasn't about truth. You also heard him say, I despise him profoundly about Trump, even though there was a lot of trumpeting of Trump on his show. So it just goes to show the level of charade, I think, that's uh, on display with some of these top cable channels. Let me throw out a, a counterpoint there, that journalism is seeking the truth. I'm a true journalist. They're seeking the truth, wherever it may lie. And if one is a journalist and they're looking objectively at all the information, uh, I think that Mr. Trump is right when he says the media is against him because they've done their homework and they realize that this is not what we want. How would you answer that? Is that journalism? Yeah, I just don't think there's such thing as an absolute truth. There are facts, but in the pursuit of news, we pursue somebody that trusts their interpretation of the fact. There is no such thing as truth. Well, I'm going to have to stand up for the enlightenment here <laughs> um, and uh, you know, uh, take a, a swing at the importance of truth. I think there are truths. I think there are facts that are demonstrable. 
I think there are people who try to, you know, uh, spin them. Obviously, there's the line about uh, lies, damn lies, and statistics. There's lots of ways to spin. But I believe in objective truth. I believe there's science that's real, that's well documented, for example, on climate change. I don't think everything's up for grabs. And I also think this question of um, objectivity in some ways is uh, maybe the wrong frame, not that it's not the frame that people use, but it's always been the case that in reporting, whether it was Ben Franklin's newspaper um, or other papers you know, throughout history um, since the printing press <laughs> emerged, uh, editorial editors make decisions about what stories to tell and what stories not to tell. That's just part of the news. That doesn't mean it's unobjective or objective. It means there's a decision-making process and it has been happening for a long, long time. I don't think that delegitimizes the information you receive as long as the information you receive is accurate and backed up to actual material evidence, um, experts and the like. So I, I'm just going to have to take a stand for the, uh, the presence and the reality of truth. So I'll counter with that. No, it's great, it's great. Um, so one of the movements is the attack of trust. You trust what she just said until you find somebody else that can convince you convincingly that you shouldn't trust that person. And that's what we're seeing in news. Whether it's Elon Musk, Tucker, anybody else, to question what you believe is the data that is irrefutable, it's the truth, it's facts. Facts don't have opinions, facts don't have interpretation, it's the data. But I agree with lies, damn lies, and statistics. I, I can convince you otherwise. We're in a world where trust is being challenged, not truth. Trust is being challenged, and I, do you trust her or you trust me? So Benj I Benjamin, can, can <laughs> Benjamin, just, you spent years no <laughs> infiltrating uh, far-right groups. What did you learn, how, that experience? How, how did that inform you? Well, it's it's... Curious that you frame it this way. I've been listening to this conversation, thinking about it in relation to the title of this panel, because this is CNN versus, what is it, Fox versus CNN versus the people, question mark. Implicit in that formulation is the idea, I think, of something quite different than what we're talking about. It is that there is a collusion or a cooperation among Fox and CNN versus a, a, an outside actor. And the question is not so much about the differences and which one is better, it's, it's the suggestion that they all actually are, are like one another. This is, this is, it's posing an, an entirely different question to us. And that, to me, in my experience as a scholar of the right, of contemporary politics in these past years, that has been, an, I wouldn't say it's a more salient issue, but it's an equally salient issue to the question of, of trust. It is a narrative about an establishment that is more internally homogenous than the surface level uh, heterogeneity might, might suggest, that is defined in its opposition to the people. And, and I, don't, I don't have a, um, an overarching simple analysis or response to that proposition, but that, that to me is a question in this conversation that is, is of equal merit, of, of equally, urg equally urgent to the question of, of truth, facts, um, and in our potential opposition to them, based on who's telling it to us. I hear you saying that uh, all sides have a piece of the truth, but not all the truth. No. <laughs> <laughs> I th it's, I'm, I'm actually not commenting on that issue. Uh, I'm, I, I think that we ought to be having a conversation about, uh, Think of it in, this, in, this, in these terms. The, the title of this panel suggests to us that there is something inherently common about CNN and Fox, and what they share in common is their opposition to us. That's a provocative question to me, and, and, it's, and it's not one that I, I, I respond to with a, a simple um, rejection or affirmation. Uh, and, and embedded in that is also a question about whether or not there is such a thing as an American people. That's a very dangerous concept, especially when, when framed in nationalist terms. Um, and embedded in that is uh, also, uh, I, I think, an intolerance or an anxiety surrounding the possibility that our media landscape might, in some sense, be defined by commonality and consensus. I think that disturbs a lot of Americans. Um, but it's, it's a vital question. I think the last two years in particular, the conflict with Ukraine, our confrontation with an ascendant Russia and China, Ought remind us that the divisions that we have in our society might not be as deep and as all-encompassing as we think they are. Well, I think that last line underscores 
the reality that they are enemies of the people because they've created these sort of phantoms of division. And there are real differences. There are real divisions. But they've amplified them in such a way that Americans are more polarized than we've ever been. And again, there are substantive differences. It's not to downplay those issues. But they've created these this, this terrible binary of good and evil. And they each tell their audience that the other side is evil. And... I think that you see that reflected in numbers. You see it in the fact that most people are way off when you ask them questions like, what's the hospitalization rate for 30-year-olds during COVID? And the average respondent wasn't one order of magnitude off, but between one and two in some cases. And you look at that and it's like, well, why is that the case? It's because fear-mongering tactics sell. Similarly, if you ask most Americans who watch Fox especially, what are the crime trends in the country? Because of the percentage of Fox News uh, attention that goes toward crime, they'd say, oh, it's going up. It's hell. I mean, I remember I had people, um, you know, we were inviting guests on to come to New York, and uh, they said, is it safe to walk outside there? And it's like, New York is fine. In 1993, 30 years ago, there were 2,000 homicides. Last year, there were 435. It's one-fifth of what it was 30 years ago, the good old days. So I think there are all these fake realities and perceptions that people have in their minds because of Fox and CNN, and it's all entertainment. And I do think, I think it's fascinating when you talk about, because uh, I think this is a big and fascinating difference is, is there, you know, there's like the Stephen Colbert line of, well, truth and reality has a liberal bias, is what he said. And I don't, I don't believe that. I think that uh, both sides are very guilty. You could argue you shouldn't do moral equivalence, but I think there you is- shouldn't do moral equivalence. I'm going to argue that. <laughs> Um, but I do believe they are more or less the enemy of the people, and they've deteriorated relations uh, between genders, races, and mostly between Americans and our institutions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to defend CNN, and I haven't been on for a while on CNN, so this is not some sort of self-interested pitch to get on CNN. <laughs> um, I, I just I don't think they're the enemy of the people. I don't think they think of the people as the enemy. I think there's a lot of good uh, reporting and analysis that comes out of CNN. I don't I don't agree with all of it. I do watch it. I watch it. I watch Fox. Maybe so you don't have to some of the time. I don't know. But Media Matters really does that far, part. Um, but I want to. I guess I want to go back to something that Marcus said about the state of corporate journalism. I don't want to misstate it because I think that those were really important points you made, Marcus. Even though I had that initial disagreement, I think there is a distorting impact from you know corporate media, from you know billionaire-owned media. In some ways, it's been that way for a long time. You know these papers. Going back to your question, Ralph, about. Um, you know, yellow journalism, uh, you know, efforts by um, Hearst to, you know, get us into a war. Um, you know, these are things that have happened historically, and they are in, in part a product of corporate media. But there is actually a very robust um, uh, nonprofit media a universe um, that needs more support, more funding. But there's been tremendous reporting, for example, by ProPublica. Uh, about the Supreme Court and other issues. I'm sure many of you have read those stories this past year about Clarence Thomas and more. Um, and there also has been some you know, terrific reporting in uh, commercial uh, outlets, Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal's um, reporting page, not its editorial page. Um, but you know, I think there's been a lot of really excellent, really well-researched, well-documented reporting, and there is distortion from commercial media. So I just wanted to maybe toss that back to you, Marcus. So let me... I think a lot of the conversation today um, is we're, we're talking about everything in the moment, but not talking about it in, in context. Uh, if, you, if you go back in history and under, to understand how American journalism has been conducted over the years, it's always been in the service of an economic model, because it is true that journalism is largely a business. There's a lot of great nonprofit journalism, probably more now than there has ever been, and it is, it's first rate, and you should all read it closely, because it's some of the best journalism in America. But the business model of journalism has determined how journalism functioned. So when William Randolph Hearst was doing you know, yellow journalism, tabloid journalism, he was doing it to sell newspapers because it was the first time that you could actually print enough newspapers to make money selling newspapers. Like you could, the printing presses rolled 24 hours a day. The reason you always see in old movies the kid shouting extra, extra sh selling newspapers is because the presses were running all day and they kept replaying the front, pa front page. And how did you sell the maximum number of newspapers? Like, you know, having scandal on the front page, have a war in Cuba. That morphed in the middle of the 20th century in the era that most people in this room grew up in. It was sort of monopoly oligopoly journalism. It was centrist, 
because the best way to make money was through advertising and the way to make money through advertising was the largest audience and the way to have the largest audience was to do centrist coverage that didn't alienate everybody. And so you kept adding horizontally new, new areas of coverage. So you had women's coverage, you had international coverage, you had sports coverage, and they built out these horizontal platforms because they wanted to monopolize their market. And in most cities in America, including here in Boulder, there was one newspaper. In some, news, some cities, they had two newspapers, one Republican and one afternoon or one morning and, and one, uh, sorry, one Republican and Democrat, one morning, one afternoon. But that was, that was the way journalism was, and they didn't want to deviate from a sort of central narrative. If you, were, if you were off the center point, if you were covering political news and you were sort of over here and everybody else was clustered at the center, you risked not being able to have the large horizontal audience that everybody else had. And Rupert Murdoch with Fox News really broke that model. And he did it because the technology changed. Cable news was different from broadcast news. Broadcast news was licensed. There were three licenses, or four if you count public TV. And so they all had an incentive to cluster at the center and deliver one narrative to the people. But when cable TV came along, the opportunity was to fragment the audience and own a segment. And Roger Ailes and Rupert Murdoch figured out a great segment. They figured out that there were a lot of people who felt disgruntled and didn't like the centrist point of view and they had a different perspective. And so they started covering news from the right. And that set the model that other media companies have subsequently followed. The internet has changed the model for print journalism, for traditional media. So today you have lots of fragmented small verticals that serve specific audiences. I don't know, you know, Max, what you think of your core audience is, but I'm sure your audience is not, you're not thinking of your audience as everybody. You're targeting a specific area, a certain kind of people, a certain kind of reader, and you're going to deliver to them a version of the news that interests them most, right? And this is what's happening in America today. People are consuming news according to their demographic and according to their little vertical. And that accounts for this, this fragmentation of the public conversation and the question of what is a fact and what is truth. I 100% agree with John that there are facts. There are facts, and people pretend there are not facts all the time, but there are facts. I believe that there is something truth, there is a truth, but none of us get ever fully gets there, but we try and get as close as we can in mainstream journalism, in, in good journalism, traditional journalism. But I, I would say, you know, it's not, it's not simple. You, if you take a snapshot of today's journalism world and you describe media, people, media is a spectrum, right? It goes all the way from the New York Review of Books on one side to What's Alex Jones's thing called? Infowars Info on the other side? And they all travel under the banner of media, all under the banner of journalism. And they're not. Anyway. I've had a number of questions that relate to the media uh, following the money and narrow casting, which is the term in broadcasting, meaning they're going after one audience rather than the broad audience. And um, this raises a couple of good questions. Here's one from a student. How do we financially and socially support moderate news? First of all, I, and this will be a segue to an attempt at answer at that question, but to Marcus's point, I think that audience first model might sound nice and fluffy and oh, we care about the people, but in reality, it's servicing a consumer base that expects a certain product. And if you don't deliver that product, Fox News viewers will go to Newsmax, which is now apparently controlled opposition because the Qatari government made an investment. But for a while, it was the next great thing in real conservative journalism. CNN viewers will go to MSNBC, etc. So I think that's real. I think one of the things that helps a news organization like us stay as balanced as we can be, even if we fall short of that platonic ideal of objectivity, but one thing that helps us is we know that we're going to lose a lot of people if we lean one side because we have a super politically diverse audience. A super, I mean, everyone from Cory Booker to Lee Stefanik, Joe Rogan to Mark Cuban, and more importantly, the young people we meet. I think if there is a thread, it tends to be moderate, apolitical, people just utterly disenfranchised. I mean, 50% of the country identifies as politically independent. That's a record number. So I think there's a huge percentage of people who are tired of a sort of sneering, snobby, uh, coastal elite media, and then also the obviously populist and angry um, conservative media. So I think we've reached that people, and yes, we may, you know, over the course, there will be like an invisible hand effect toward more anti-establishment coverage because we get those people, but 
I think you are, you know, Walter Cronkite had, uh, I think, four times the audience of all the primetime cable shows combined, and he knew that the uncle, conservative uncle was watching and the liberal niece was watching. And I think that helps keep you in the middle of the lane. In terms of business model, I don't think there's a good one. I really don't. I think the best attempt is selling your own product because if you're ad-based and then you're impression-based, you skew virality, you skew, you skew clickbait. And if you're subscription-based, which sounds nice, I think you skew more ideological where people will pay you kind of like the free press in New York Times if you advance their ideological chips in a way. So I think it actually leads toward more partisan and aggressive news because who wants to you know, pay for vanilla? They want to give you some you know, juicy exposés and hot takes. So I think there's no perfect model. I think the closest thing to independence is selling your own product and sorry to ramble, but I really okay. thought that was important. Max, you've got five million followers of free, fact-centric news. And how do you make money? Well, this is this question top of mind. I mean, we've moved toward an ad model with sort of, you know, advertisers you align with, and they've never, you know, a lot of the ones, we're not getting JP Morgan Chase. There's a lot of smaller companies that reach young people and are relatively newer brands because they tend to align with us more, a lot of health brands, et cetera. And that's how we make money now. We view it as imperfect, but we also believe you can set up parameters and you can have editorial discipline. And again, if there's ever a sense of skewing of your coverage, your people will leave you. So right now we're ad-based, but we're moving toward subscription. And as I said, I think ultimately a product because that allows you to reach a lot of people at once um, and sell something that is sort of self-sustaining as opposed to outside capital or outside ad money. So I, I want to, one, clarify what I said about absolute truth versus truth, and nothing in life is free. If you want information, you want news, you either pay for it in your time, you pay for it in advertisements coming in your face, you pay for it, even if you're a nonprofit, which relies on operating costs and donations, things like that, nothing is free, but we have a society who says, I, I don't want to pay for this, I want all this for free. Then you don't want the truth. Well, it used to be free. Now, I'm talking about something that predates most people in this room. It's called the Fairness Doctrine. And prior to 1980, I believe was the uh, year that they changed this, um, that any broadcast outlet, and I believe this applied somewhat to print too, that if they were having any coverage of a, uh, a political candidate, they had to provide equal coverage to the candidate opposing that individual. Equal fairness, you had to give equal time. And so it, it back then, now of course this is back in Walter Cronkite days, where we had one shared reality uh, because of the concentration of media, and now with the internet we have thousands somewhat chaos, and people are choosing echo chambers. So should we bring back the fairness doctrine? Yeah, but it's still not free. I, I, I no, think we should bring back the fairness doctrine. I think there were a number of efforts to uh, assail that doctrine, predominantly driven by the right wing at the time, called you know, so-called conservatives. Um, and it has had a negative impact to not have that doctrine, to not have that enforcement. But we've also seen an assault on basically all of the levers of government, uh, an effort to try to have the FCC not uh, do its job, um, even when it was attempting to secure um, information about ads run in major markets so that there would be some information about who's really buying these attack ads, these dark money groups that are spending heavily in elections that, you know, due to Citizens United, that terrible decision that um, I can go on about that in a second, but uh, a, a decision that was improvident and wrong uh, and should never been issued because Clarence Thomas, his wife, had received $500,000 from Harlan Crow as that decision was pending in order to start a group to take advantage of that decision. But that decision caused a chaos in our political system. It injected uh, billions of dollars, literally since 2010, into our elections without any information, for the most part, about who's really funding those attack ads. So the FCC tried to do something about that. There was a he heavy pushback, but they were able ultimately to get some disclosure 
in the major media markets of if a group buys an ad, who that group is. But even then, what's happened is these right-wing groups have created these shell corporations so that you only know the first shell, not the second shell or the third shell. And so the fact that we don't have that kind of reform in our political system, we don't even have the baseline of disclosure um, to deal with this erosion, this attack on the Federal Election Campaign Act, means that we have a lot more disinformation happening at the most crucial moments around our elections. But can I just, like, let, let's take, go back to your, the question on the Fairness Doctrine. Um, the, the Fairness Doctrine applied to broadcast television. It doesn't, you wouldn't apply today to cable television because it's not governed in the same way. It wouldn't apply to the internet. CNN has 126 million digital monthly uniques. So, bigger than Max's even. And Why'd you have to say it? <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't apply there. I think, and it, and it, it also would go to a, another issue which I think a lot of, will resonate with a lot of people in the room, which is if you applied the fairness doctrine today in the current political campaign, I think there are a lot of people who would say, giving equal time to the two sides might not actually be the journalistically responsible thing to do because I'm not sure the two sides are always representing information you know, honestly and accurately, and I'm not sure the issues that the sides are focused on uh, are deserving of the same amount of attention. I think if you were exercising journalism judgment, you might not give the same amount of attention to both sides. I'm gonna have to agree with Marcus. I really appreciate that point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will say on Citizens United, which I could not agree more with Lisa, that it is a disaster, and I don't know as much about the shady history of uh, why the Supreme Court uh, kept it humming, but I will point out if I if I can add one thing though, Silicon Valley and Wall Street support the Democrats. So I don't think it's just a Republican issue, and I think um, the, the largest corporations are increasingly aligned with that, which is a real fascinating shift that sort of corporate America has leaned Democrat lately. But I don't deny that it, it, its its impact is is terrible and anti-democratic. I want to. On the Citizens Thanks, United man. front, can I just say one thing? I, I realize we're way off topic, <laughs> but you know, Max referred to the, the shady background of Citizens United. I think we should be careful. I think this is actually where, where journalists and commentators fall into traps. You know, you can read the Citizens United decision and disagree with it, as I vehemently do, but you, but you should read the decision and you can judge that decision. You, you can understand how the court might have reached that decision in ways that were not corrupt, I'm not dismissing anything Clarence Thomas may or may not have done, but may have reached that decision on the basis of the viewpoints of those justices. And I think in our society today, we're far too quick to judge and assume things about people in power, to assume corruption because we can find alignments, we can see sort of some kind of correlation, and we assume it. And I think we would all do well, especially in journalism, to step back and stick to the facts as we can know them and let the facts do the talking for us and not make judgments and, and sort of casually s so surmise I'm gonna to, things. I'm going to have to now make a point of personal privilege, as they say in Congress, <laughs> because the fact is, is that that was a five to four decision. And if Clarence Thomas had recused himself for the secret fact that his wife received a half a million dollars to fund a group to take advantage of the decision before it came, that would have been a 4-4 decision that would have resulted in the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, BICRA, McCain-Feingold, remaining the law of the land. Sure. So but, that was, and that was real. Understood. And, and, but, the, understand, and the document- But also, I understand that to be true, but there, as you know, and as, as I think we all probably regret, there is no requirement that Supreme Court justices recuse themselves in that situation. And there he, and he there should, should be, and well, there I, is, in theory. My point is simply, again, if you read the decision, the four justices, other than Clarence Thomas, who supported that decision, had a lot of reasoning that I disagree with for their decision, and he could well have reached the decision entirely independent of his wife's involvement with any group. That's but let me, just, let me just, and I, I know we've, we, I have diverted us, but the fact is, is that just because you receive money and do something you were gonna do doesn't mean it's not corrupt. But, but it I, doesn't I, mean it's not unethical, and, it doesn't, and just because you don't recuse yourself under rules that basically leave that decision to yourself as a judge, an erroneous uh, ethical regime, doesn't mean the result is just, and I think that it's profoundly correct to criticize that and make sure people understand that that decision was a corrupted decision. Even though I take your point about not being cavalier or casual about it, I have not been cavalier or casual about it. I have documented every single piece of that story. Although there were four other justices that Who would side, have been not the would, majority. 
with him. But still, I mean, it just goes to show. And I actually think the 5-4, and by the way, Marcus, I totally agree. I think there's a weird conspiracy strain where, and it's also sloppy. C- conspiracies from same sources contradict. They don't make sense, all that. So I totally agree. I also think, going back to the objective objectivity point, it's fascinating that so many Supreme Court decisions come 5-4. Now, most are 9-0-8-1. They don't get the same amount of coverage. But that goes to show that these are justices interpreting law, not sounding off in their own opinions. They're interpreting law. It should be objective. And yet there are still so many 5-4 decisions. I think that's and predating the crazy polarization. A lot of these justices were confirmed. Like, you look at Scalia and, uh, and, and RBG, and they were— Three votes combined between against them for their confirmation hearings. I mean, it goes to show these are renowned judges, and they still disagree so much. I think that's a fascinating point about yes, there are facts, but there's also the interpretation and values and all that will disagree. Okay, getting back, for the getting Supreme back to tomorrow. media. Hang on, yeah. Lisa. Getting back to media and money. Uh, there's several questions up here that uh, relate to how do we find uh, objective information. How do the under 30s get their information? Because many of them are just totally turned off by the toxic nature of of so much of the news media. And a student asked the question that indicates there's a lot of research that media is more powerful than we may think. So how do we make our media more objective and able to reach the youth, and where does AI come into this? So I, I think I, I mean, That last one snuck in there. Yeah, the last one got in there. Uh, I think well, AI has the capability to change everything we believe is true, and the, and the ability to seek out objectivity, seek out truth, it has that, that, that ability. But I think the question is wrong, is how, you want the easy answer, how do I find objective source of news? One is stop looking for a single source. Yeah. You have to make your own. Agreed. The whole reason for institutions of learning is to teach you how to critically think. Yep. Yep. Seek out the facts, make your decision, stop looking for a single source of information. Yep. Yeah, Be- and I, Be- oh, wait, oh, go ahead. Please. Buried in that, in that question is the suggestion uh, that, and, and, it's, and it's also implied by the conversation we've been having up to this point, that really we can track the polarization of our country by these media twists and turns. We heard the 1980s reference twice in these histories. Um, just yesterday, I was sitting on, a, on an incredible undergraduate thesis panel for a, uh, for a student who's also volunteering in, in, in our conference today, studying and tracking polarization over time. Does it track with these media developments? Kind of, but not, in, not completely. Um, we haven't addressed where that and, and why that need for polarization, for demonizing the other side, um, why, that is, why that is so beneficial, why, why there is so much currency in that, in this, in this media landscape and in this media industry. I continue to think that the, com- that the conversation we're having in this panel is not exclusively about media, per se, that it might actually come from someplace else. So I do want to throw that out there. This question suggests that we ought to simply look at media transformations to understand something else, namely polarization, and I'm not sure um, that, that that is actually fully justified. I think one of the biggest strides the media need to make to be more trusted and to help America get back on track is to make better story selection. And right now, a lot of it's low-hanging fruit, the juicy tidbits. If you feed people a steady diet of culture war and political theater, you're going to have an even more divided country. And that's what you have right now. I don't know if you notice this at your family reunions, but when people disagree or, or get, you know, bring up, broach those very controversial political topics, it's usually one or two they're constantly fired up about that aren't even that relevant to the country. And that's because in the 24 7 news cycle, where uh, if it bleeds, it leads, and ultimately with social media and virality, it elevates the most divisive, fear mongering, and controversial stories. And so that's led to this sort of mindless polarization that you see now where. Again, where one side's talking about uh, pens swimming all day long in the trans women's sports issue, and, and all day long. And not to say that it doesn't deserve airtime, but it's the number one issue. In the, and then the other side, and, and so that, I think, story selection, we've realized, is one of the most important issues. If you cover culture war and political theater all day, as the legacy media do, you're not going to make any progress on 
uh, it, with, with trust in media, and it looks like Marcus has well, a just, point. I, uh, just in response to that, Lisa, I'm sorry. The, I, I want to repeat something I said a minute ago, which is the media model today is to cater to an audience. Like every, every publication, every television channel, maybe not the broadcast television, I'll exempt them for the minute, but you know, I think if you, can, if you look at the New York Times, which is a, I, can, I think is still a great newspaper, it has its flaws and we can probably spend all day enumerating them, but you know, it's, it's targeting a very specific market. It's targeting the 100 million people globally who speak English, who are politically liberal, economically engaged, who like food and like to travel and maybe play puzzles and games. But it's a very specific audience. And the audience knows the Times is for them. The Times knows who its audience is. And so you know, every one of these media companies, they're not all the same. So when they make story selections, what Max is talking about, they're making story selections according to what their audience is most likely to be interested in. And that's because if, they engage, if their audience is engaged, they can sell more subscriptions if they're in that business. They can sell that more advertising because they have a larger audience if they're in that business. And they can sell data, which is going to be the way a lot of media companies in the future are going to make their money, is not through advertising or subscriptions. It's going to be, you know, Max knows what his five million readers are doing. He knows what they're interested in. And as advertisers are trying to figure out how to reach those audiences, not just on his platform, but other platforms, people are gonna come knocking on his door and try and buy his data so they can figure out where his audience is going on different platforms. And in order to have that kind of engagement, in order to have that economic potential, they have to cater to an audience and they're gonna make story selections on the basis of that. So I wanna finally conclude by underscoring the idea that you absolutely have to know how to find information. There's great information, you have to know where you're going for it. And, every, and universities and schools should teach kids media literacy. There are programs, there's a National Media Literacy Project in, in Washington that's now in high schools around the country. And it's critical that everybody understand how to get information, because it's out there. I just wanted to uh, second that about media literacy, and I wanted to say um, I agree with John's point um, as well about the importance of seeking out multiple sources. For me, I really look to a number of investigative journalists across the country, uh, both at the national press and in state outlets to see you know, how they're covering key issues. And I speak with a lot of reporters and investigators you know, frequently, um, share research that we have, um, and then you know, see what they do with it, see where they go, see what they find. And I really, um, I have to say, I have a lot of confidence in the integrity of investigative journalists. I don't know about like, you know, political horse race journalists, that's a different sort of a machine. But the fact is, is that they're, you know, they constantly ask me, you know, what's the proof of this? Where's the evidence? What's the data? What, you know, where did, where did you get this from a FOIA, an open records request? Where's this data in this particular place? Or where did this information come from? And so I find them to be, you know, very skeptical, scrutinizing, and very careful in how they tell those stories. But that's a particular part of journalism that I follow closely, investigative journalism, which is distinct from some of the commentary for commentary's sake journalism. Okay. <laughs> Caught me unawares. Um, there, there's a couple of questions that relate that uh, one of the panelists, I can't recall who, mentioned there's a commonality of all media. Now, is it only that they're all programming for the money? Is that a fair statement? I have a story I could share just briefly. Um, I was at a closed door meeting about a decade ago with um, some of the leaders of some of the major outlets, Reuters, ABC News, Gannett, uh, and others. And it was a discussion of this question of uh, journalism, the focus of journalism, sort of the First Amendment privilege, the right, the, the, the fact that journalists have this protection for the press in our First Amendment. And um, during this conversation, the person at the time who was representing Gannett and they've since published some very good stories since then, a lot of great stories in USA Today and other outlets, but in this particular instance, the person who was representing them said, we don't have any obligation to report the news. We're giving people what they want. If they want more crosswords, we're giving them more crosswords. We don't have to cover local news and we're not, we don't have to cover Africa. At that point, the person representing ABC News says, you know, uh, as a national outlet, you have an obligation to cover what's happening on you know, a continent in this world and people of these countries, uh, not just, you know, what's happening in the sports, you know, pages, basically. And the Gannett rep said, no, we don't. It's a business. 
Um, and that was really sort of shocking to see that I appreciate the fact that the ABC News person pushed back on that idea. But I do think that it was revealing to me, shocking to me in essence, to have this notion by a, a person who in essence helped control uh, a, a number of outlets that that really wasn't their job. It wasn't really to tell the news, it was to give people what they want. And I do think that that is, um, in fact, like as shocking as it was for me to hear someone say that out loud, um, and maybe that's not how, certainly not how all of Gannett sees this, and you know, there's, as I said, been a lot of really good reporting, but the idea that that is an animating force is probably true. I, I would ask everyone as we consider commonality uh, to think back to a moment recently, two years ago, when there seemed to be a great deal of commonality on our news coverage, and that was following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, it was quite remarkable, I think, and this was, this was borne out also in opinion surveys, with uh, in this country that is so divided, that is so polarized, that you looked around and you saw broad consensus within our, within our country, but also transcending the, bar the borders between CNN and Fox and MSNBC. Everyone seemed in agreement with this. Uh, that we could identify who the aggressor was and who the victim was in, in, this, in this particular uh, dynamic. But you could almost, uh, bear with me in this, you could almost sense in the air some discontent with that, that some of the larger media personalities, um, and they came primarily from the right, with, with certain exceptions, but some of them just kind of got restless. You knew that their business model could not survive in this type of environment, and you had to get something else going, and the first shots had to do with bio labs, and that died eventually. It was, it was like an attempt, it was an experiment to see could we, rile, could we rile people up around this. But as time has gone on, that's eroded. There is, I, I brought up the question of, of commonality and homogeneity because I think that was, it's called to question by the title of this panel. Um, but I actually don't, I, I think quite the opposite is true. I think, and we've, we've heard a lot of uh, examples of this, even though I want us to talk about that, I, th I am still convinced by um, the data that my, my fellow panelists have, su have supplied us today, um, suggesting that it really is niche audiences, it is division, it is deepening the convictions of your tribe that is the currency of our, of our media landscape. If, if I may offer a little bit of optimism here, I do think <laughs> that we can't get too relativistic about media bias and media business models. There's a hierarchy. There are some egregiously biased and clearly partisan and divisive news organizations today, and there are some that are doing better. I think Axios, not perfect. It's not covering everything exactly right. Their story selection has issues, but I think it's good, and I think a lot of people are so fed up, so outraged by media division. Again, 50% of the country is politically independent. That's an astonishing number. I think it was 31% in 2004. That's a big jump. So I think you, you see that, and there's appetite for more objective or nonpartisan or, again, uh, you know, not absurdly biased coverage which is maybe not the highest bar to set for journalism, but it's better than what we have right now. And so I think one way to get around a lot of these concerns and, and uh, business model incentives is to market your mission to people and say, it's okay if the news cycle is boring at times. It's okay if some stories or facts don't agree with your priors and don't give you that confirmation bias. That's all right. It's okay. But you know it's good for you to get more objective information. And so kind of suck it up. You're tired of the status quo and look for a different viewpoint. And I think that's one reason why we've been able to attract this incredibly politically diverse audience of Roka is you tell this to people and then it's our job to have the editorial discipline and also the business common sense to know that we've got to s sell what we promised. Okay, we're down to maybe six or seven minutes. And we know the only constant in life is change. So what are the trends, if any? Where are we going with our media? Can I, let me start, I want to throw out one more set of statistics because I think it's important. The average viewer age of the television networks we've been talking about, CNN is 67, Fox is 68, MSNBC is 71, almost old enough to run for president. <laughs> um, the number of people who, the reach of these television, of the cable channels today in America, maximum reach, 70 million households, down from 90 million households a few years ago because of cord cutting. The, the audience, the average audience size of the most widely watched cable news 
channel, which was Fox last year, was the average audience size at any given moment, higher and lower at different points, 1.2 million. This is a country of 330 something million people. It's the lowest audience size they've had since 2015. So the future of media is probably not any of these companies we've been talking about today as inflammatory as conversations about them can be. The future of media is going to be things like Max, who's now gonna have 5,200,000 <laughs> users. The, the future of media is going to be, it's gonna be digital, it's gonna be, it's going to be niche, it's gonna be people paying for content they like, it's gonna be content that's created by individuals that's delivered over platforms like TikTok, and remember, every one of those social media platforms, their algorithms drive people into these little cul-de-sacs of like-mindedness. And the, the secret to success in media is, is to figure out how to serve an audience in a way that makes them feel like they should pay you or they should pay you with their attention so you can sell advertising. And I think keep your eye on, on local media. I think it will come back. I worry about it, but I, you know, Boulder is a great place to look at local media because you have the Boulder Reporting Lab, you have Colorado Public Media, you have the Colorado Sun, Colorado public uh, politics, there's tons of media. The problem with media as it is today is it's very fragmented. You know, how do you, you're gonna like look at eight different websites every morning to find out what's going on as opposed to reading the newspaper. But I think one of the solutions that's coming down the pike is people are gonna build with algorithms and AI, to your AI question, mechanisms for tracking the news that you care most about from outlets that you trust. And from outlets maybe that can be trusted if you have good judgment. So I, for me, it's stop fighting to maintain the past and adapt the future. Uh, just with all these statistics, I spend an inordinate amount of time on X and other platforms because there are super powered individuals that have the ability to influence our minds and the minds of our youth greater than any mass media ever will. And if that's not adapted and then mass media change to adapt to that global change, then they'll wither on the vines like penny papers did. I'm concerned. I won't, I won't offer any predictions about the future of media, but I can, I can give you a reason why I'm concerned about some of these developments. It's not just the fact that we're all going to go into smaller and smaller and more, more uh, devout echo chambers. I wonder about some of the lies of the experience. I'm sitting next to two people who I think have much larger Twitter followings than, than I have. Um, and yet, I can also become intoxicated with the feeling on Twitter that I, too, am really close to the levels of power and that I, too, have a hand or a voice in decision making. I, I think that's a lie and I wonder long term about the effects of, of, of that, of becoming disgruntled, of becoming resentful for, uh, for this experience. I'm, I'm hopeful that there will be some sort of bounce back. I think it's very hard to predict what will happen beyond five years from now. But there's such awareness about the laughably polluted and biased media landscape that I think there's going to be at least more interest in saying, okay, even though they're feeding me what I want, I'm going to look elsewhere and challenge my echo chamber in some way. What I will say is I don't think tech is the solution at all. It's funny to hear tech bros pay. Well, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, news bias is a human problem. We'll get over this quickly. Then you look at the launches of OpenAI or Microsoft's ChatGPT. You look at Elon Musk's Grok. Grok. You look at, you look at, I mean, Google's Gemini. All these chatbots that are supposed to be, oh, well, tech will figure it out. They won't. And even if there are tools that are developed, it'll be humans who have to decide to use them in a smart way because social media as it is, and certainly the AI chatbots, are not going to solve that problem. I'll just, I'll just say that I, I agreed with everything Marcus said in that last, uh, uh, that last answer and also what Max said. And I just have, um, I still have hope. Maybe I'm just an optimist in that way, but I, I feel like despite this issue, or maybe it's not, maybe I shouldn't be concerned about this issue of who, you know, the growing independence, because I, I actually think that when you look at the elections outside of the media, you have, I think, a growing awareness about you know, key problems facing society. You have more discussions of the concentration of wealth than we've ever had. You have more discussions about labor rights. You have more discussions about the effect on the environment. And so even within this landscape, actually there's a lot of good things, there are a lot of good things happening in terms of raising public awareness. Um, and, and that gives me hope. Um, and I'll also say there is a, a tremendous a media reform outlet out there uh, called Free Press uh, that's worth looking at some of their proposals for reform on this question, uh, the question that Ralph posed um, earlier. And um, just want to thank you all for coming uh, on Wednesday morning uh, to hear 
uh, a, a, a rambunctious, uh, <laughs> arousing <laughs> debate about these issues. And it's a joy to be on this panel with these fine panelists and with our hosts. Okay, lightning round. Are you hopeful for the future of media? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, hope is all we have. Yeah, all right. <sighs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I second John. Hope is all we have. Hope is an act of resistance. <laughs> all right. Well, I think we're out of time. So I want to thank our very interesting panel Marcus Broccoli, John Spencer, Benjamin Teitelbaum, Max Toey, and Lisa Graves. And thank you.